What's up guys, Dom here, and welcome to my first VOD review. Today we're going to be going over iMortals vs Cloud9 in week 5, day 2. Um, this is a game that had a lot of cool 2, two vs 2 stuff, and a lot of cool jungle interaction and jungle pathing things that I'll be going over with you guys, and I hope you enjoy. Um, we're going to start with pick ban here, and the first ban from Immortals was Poppy, which I think is a really strong ban against C9, um, specifically because Balls has shown decent Poppy performances, and because it's also a champion that has given Hoonies problems in the past. I mean, everyone remembers Hanser solo killing him a couple times with Poppy into Fiora, and it's a champion that counters a lot of the dash and mobile top laners that Hoonie likes to play. For example, Riven has, has a bunch of dashes, Jax is something that Hoonie still plays, even though he hasn't shown it in LCS. Fiora, for example, um, is something that he's played before in the LCS. He's had Echo, um, which is another dash champion that would probably lose the lane to Poppy as well. So, just an overall solid ban here. And uh, we're going to be jumping into the rest of it. C9 chooses the Soraka ban here. Target ban versus Adrian. Um, he's the Soraka main of LCS, and he's been going off every game with it, so it makes a lot of sense for them to ban it. And Huni uh, bans out the Corky. Obviously, Immortals bans out the Corky, but Huni was the one that clicked the button, so we're going with Huni bans out the Corky. Strong flex pick, super strong mid laner, and it makes sense for them to just ban it on blue side because they plan on first picking other things. Lulu ban, uh, Lulu enables a lot of carry tops, which is what Immortals likes to play, so Lulu ban makes sense against their team. The Gangplank ban is something I don't agree with. I normally prefer first banning or first picking Gangplank on blue side, but they decide that they want Nidalee 100% versus Rush. They don't want to let Rush play Nidalee, so they aren't comfortable trading GP for Nidalee here, so they would rather just ban out the GP. Um, this plays into the last ban from Cloud9, which kind of reveals a lot of their strategy. They ban out Janna and Soraka, which are the two range supports that Adrian primarily plays. And the reasoning for this is because they want to play aggressive bot lanes as they think that that is the weakest point of Immortals and they think that that is where they can get the most advantage. So by banning out the range supports, they're forcing a combat support matchup and they're hoping that they can win that out. Immortals first picks the Nidalee. Obviously, it's one of Rush's best champions. They set up for it um, by banning Corky and Gangplank and they decide that if they get Nidalee, they're comfortable playing that into anything as it has no counters in the jungle. So, yep, that's the first rotation. You have Alistar and Lee Sin come out from Cloud9. The Lee Sin is pretty much just to hide the rest of their comp. They think that Lee Sin is good into Nidalee, which it's a fine matchup into Nidalee, and they also don't want to show any of their next picks, so that's why they pick it. Callista Braum, uh, strong bot lane, doesn't have many counters, so they decide to go with um, strong bot lane, no counters, and saving counter picks for their solo laners. Or at least a counter pick for one solo laner. The Jin is, I guess, the answer to the Callista from C9. It's probably the reason they went with the support bans here, is they want to play Alistar Jin into something like Callista, and they feel like they can win the matchup. So C9 has chosen to give their bot lane essentially a counter pick here, and they showed a victor early in order to do that. Um, and this is just a way for them to. Uh, get a strong comp that they want and they're playing to what they think their strength is which their bot lane is has been pretty solid in lane they're gonna try to abuse adrian and wild turtle so yeah the lux is apparently the pick that people go into victor it's really hard for victor to abuse lux it pretty much ends up being a matchup where both people farm evenly and lux ends out ends up outranging later on so um that's the reasoning behind the lux pick up there and the Quinn pick is taken for Immortals, and that is a pick that I just absolutely hate in the LCS right now. I I hate the Quinn pick, because I feel like you have to do so much to end up winning the game, and if you pick Quinn, C9 will just end up last picking Malphite. They get a good engage champion into um, your poke slash four ranged champion comp, um, so it, it doesn't abuse Malphite, in my opinion, hard enough for it to be valued late game because you have to do so much work as Quinn. You have to smash them in lane. You have to use your ult to create map plays. If you get caught while you're ulting in between lanes, you lose the value of the champion. If you lose your lane, you lose the value of the champion. It just seems so much easier to play any of the other picks. I'd rather see a Fiora there, um, something that can eventually split versus the Malphite. Um, 
I'm just more happy with other things rather than Quinn. Um, there's a point where Quinn will just not do damage to Malphite anymore, and every game that I've seen in the LCS, the Quinn has got to that point where he is just completely useless versus the Malphite. He's not making plays around the map, and he just ends up like losing the game. So, yeah. I am not a fan of Quinn versus Malphite. And yeah, I've watched some VOD reviews, and it seems like normally they keep the casters on super low, so that's what I've decided to do for my VOD review. So yeah, we're into the game here. So Nelly vs. Lee Sin, this is a matchup that um, changes over time. In the early game, Nidalee's able to do a lot of work. Uh, the Nidalee gets to choose all the fights with the Lee Sin. She can normally evade him. She can get a farm advantage early. And she's actually just a stronger champion before 6. But at 6, Lee Sin is actually able to kill the Nidalee. So it's up to Rush to get to 6 without getting too far behind. And it's up to Rain over to secure some type of early game advantage. Which um, I think he actually does this game, but he does it in a really clever way. So um, I hope you guys really enjoy his pathing. I think it's actually really excellent pathing and a good idea from Rush, but even better pathing from Randover. So we'll be going over what both of them choose to do and why each one is so good here. So yeah, you see this like small little trade that looked like nothing. This trade actually had a big advantage in the bot lane. When Callista shoved Jin all the way back, she got a ward deep on the Gromp. I don't know if it was Adrian that got the ward, but regardless, the fact that they had pressure in the bot lane got them a ward on Gromp, which forces um, C9 to do something that they don't want to do. They either have to lane swap here, which I think could have been a good idea because I don't think either of their lanes wins super hard, or they have to try to stop the enemy Gromp. And since Immortals knows they see that they see on Gromp, there's no way that they're starting their own Gromp. They have to fight here. Uh, obviously, it's not the enemy Gromp, it's the enemy Golems, whatever. It's the enemy camp. That's what matters. And yeah, Braum level 1 it's ridiculous. Just flashes forward, autos the gin, the gin, and then they just follow up with um, three more autos and just kill them. And it was a decent amount of summoners traded. There's no flashes on Immortals bot lane, and there's no flash on Sneaky. So both junglers immediately now turn their focus to bot lane. They both want their clears to end up on bot side, and they're going to try to um, make some plays around this lane because this is the lane that's easiest to gank at this point. So the, the path that I wanted to bring light to here was Leeson's path of skipping his red buff. I thought this was actually pretty smart because what he ideally wants to do is get level 6. And if Nidalee does a normal clear where he um, does his red buff and clears towards bot side, then Rush will be completely safe to do this. He'll skip all of his buffs. He'll go Golems, Wraiths, Wolves, and then Gromp. And he'll end up uh, recalling after that and then doing the same thing again, but adding in his buffs this time, and then he'll get an experience lead. And this is actually a really different path from Rainover. Like, he only did his blue side jungle, and then he just did the crab and then walked into the enemy bot side jungle. So this is something that almost no one ever does, and it ends up countering what Rush is doing, because Rush doesn't have any buffs. There's no way he can fight the Nidalee without a red buff. Um, and he's forced off his Gromp, so he actually didn't get anything off this. He's done three camps only, three small camps only at 3 minutes and 20 seconds, and he's only level 3, so he's actually in a pretty bad spot right now. But yeah, um, the problem that I that I don't like with the 2v2 from C9 right here is they need pressure in two lanes from the jungler at the same time. They need their jungler top to help Malphite push out the wave and get a good recall off. And they also need him bot because bot has no summoners and they're going to be afraid of getting ganked. So they're just in a pretty bad spot here. Um, Rush shows top and Immortals sends Rain over bot, takes the enemy blue buff. And C9 actually sees him on the ground right now. Rush actually dropped a word on the ground so they know that Rain over is behind them. And their wave is pushing out so they're pretty much screwed right here because... Rainover can get behind them, gank them if they ever push up, but their wave is pushing away from them, and they need to get the wave into the Immortals Tower at some point, or they're just going to end up um, losing the trade. They'll lose up so much farm that they'll get level 6 by Callista. Callista will throw the Brahmin, and they'll just instantly die. 
So yeah, Balls gets the recall off. He gets a health crystal and cloth armor. So now he's able to actually tank up um, the Quinn's damage in lane. And C9's bot lane chooses to fight here, which is actually super, super risky. Um, they're pretty much just bluffing that Rush is coming down bot because they know that Rainover was on Gromp. They know that he's down here. And um, they end up trading one for one. They kill Adrian. High gets him with like an Ignite and like an Otter or something. But um, this fight, in my opinion, should have got a, gone a lot worse for uh, C9. If Immortals just played it safer, Adrian didn't die and he just truly baited it. Uh, their wave is coming in. They're literally just going to sit here and get zoned until the jungler gets down here to push the wave out into the turret. So, yeah, uh, if you have two lanes that aren't able to get pressure by themselves, um, obviously this one was skewed because they ended up dying at level one. But um, if you have two lanes that do get uh, screwed 1v1 or 2v2, you should end up having to 2v1 that game, or you should be looking for a 2v1, which they didn't this game. And Huni proves to me why I hate Quinn versus Malphite right here. I don't even think it's that good of a matchup anyway. Like, yeah, you should have a CS lead. But um, he gets greedy, he doesn't get a recall off, and he dies to the Malphite. If you don't smash the lane of Quinn into Malphite, the pick is just useless to me. It just doesn't do anything. So, yeah. Balls, solo kills, Huni. Which... I mean, I, th I personally think Balls is a good player, but I guess the whole meme on Reddit is just like, oh, he's Diamond 2, he sucks. Like, well, the Diamond 2 player just went off and, like, got an advantage in a lane that's losing. Now, this right here is an intelligent fight from C9. Um, this time, they go aggressive knowing that the enemy jungler is top. Um... And Rush here actually makes a mistake. He's fighting over his Wraith, but after Quinn pushes out the wave, she's definitely going to roam, and he needs to be more aware of the fact that Quinn's coming down from top and just sacrifice his whole top side jungle. Like, it sucks completely to do this, but at least his red buff isn't spawning since he did the interesting jungle clear where he skipped it. So he just has to sack those two camps and walk towards bot side and just forget about it. He ends up losing his flash for it, and he loses, like, a lot of pressure in general. Rainover just shows, like, right through here. He just walks straight through, hits a spear, and then ends up killing Rush. He walked, actually, straight through the turret, so... Um, the team was collapsing on the, um, Nidalee, and all Rush needed to do was just war jump the spear and not die. And that would have been a free catch on Rainover. So, yeah, when you have Malphite, level 6 versus a flashless Gwyn... No matter how the Quinn lost the flash, he could have got the kill, he could have just went and went for a roam, killed someone and got the flash, he could just get solo killed and lose the flash. If Quinn doesn't have flash and you have Malphite Lee Sin, the Malphite should just 100% save the ulti for the Quinn. Like, there they got nothing off the ultimate, they had no mana on Jensen, there's no way they're going to win that fight. What they need to do is just have Malphite match up with the Quinn, and Lee Sin can literally gank that Quinn from any angle. Lee Sin can just walk directly through the lane, Tell Malphite to ult the Quinn once he gets into range, and Lee Sin just Ws to a creep and just kills him since Lee is level 6, and obviously when Lee hits level 6, gets big power spike. So yeah, Rush ends up killing this guy, solo kill by himself, but like he has to play it pretty well to do it, and he ends up getting cleaned up by Rainover anyway, so this just shows you like why you want to be focusing on saving your ults and making coordinated plays that essentially was just like a solo queue play from rush it was like oh this guy's pushing up i'm gonna kill him by myself but if you want to guarantee that play and make sure you get pressure the way you do that is by having your malphite save your ultimate ult onto him from lane leeson just comes through the lane w stick creep insta kill so yeah junglers are top they know both junglers cannot be bottom yet and they fight bot again. Like, you see how these lanes, the way that they play right now is anytime the jungler isn't on their side of the map, they're just all inning. Complete all ins, which makes a lot of sense to me. Um, but honestly, like, those all ins should be going better for Immortals. I think they're misplaying them. Um, there's a flashless or uh, a Jin without heal, and they're up a heal. I think if they just focus the Jin, throw the Braum at the Jin, they end up just winning that fight 100%.
So, yep. Yeah, this is a this is an action-packed game, but um, most of the plays that you're seeing, besides for the first all-in from C9, they're calculated plays. They're playing to where they have pressure and playing to um, where the enemies have made mistakes. So I was actually fine with this. I wouldn't look at this game and be like, oh, they're just like it's just NA teams doing NA things. I actually think these are two pretty strong teams playing well. Like the reason High is going for this is because he's he sees that the enemy. Um, he sees the enemy jungler top, so they're trying to all in. I think right here, instead of going for high, high has no cooldowns. What you do is you throw the Braum at Sneaky. He gets a free Q, so you get a stack, and then Sneaky has to either flash away immediately, and then you get a free flash for a Callisto ult, or you just end up all inning him, you get the um, CC on him, you hit the passive, and you get a kill. Um, so I think that could have been played better for Immortals, but either way, I guess it was fine. They traded one for one and got a teleport out, so... Um, their next play should just be centered around them having teleport advantage. So yeah, what they want right now, the reason that they, um, the, the reason, what they should do, I actually don't remember if they do that. I think they actually might send people top here to just get the extra out of turret. In general, I, I actually disagree with this, even though it is smart to take the turn and rotate. What I would like to do, personally, um, is use your teleport advantage. If you go into bot side jungle, you get deep wards, you can get a free teleport play off on the bot lane, kill the Jin, and then take a tier two. Um, so I personally, am, I'm a fan of just using my teleport advantage over um, trying to just like snowball the game, doing the super standard like chase extra turrets. But I guess it's really just an option. Um, being able to like make a play top is is good too. Um, you know the enemy jungler is farming bot, so making the dive play or the enemy AD carry is farming bot, so making the dive play here is is a fine and like reasonable play. But I, I think there's other options, and I'd like to see teams um, doing more of the the less standard option. Yeah, this is just um, a reactionary play from C9. They see Pope Alter running through a place that has no wards, and they end up taking a two v two. Honestly, Hooney should have just canceled his TP there. Um, they thought they could fight, but yeah, they end up getting cleaned up. Rain over gets one back, but overall, you you want more um, solid plays. And that's that's essentially just a waste of TP. It's a TP that ended up being detrimental instead of like a TP cross map to where the ball line is. If they do make the play top, something that something else that, that, that you can do is you can have your Quinn recall same time as your bot lane, go bottom, pressure the Jin 1v1, and then still have teleport to dive top. That's a way to guarantee that the enemy AD carry stays there, and you're definitely going to get a 4v5 or a 3v4, depending on if the mid laners roam. Yeah, this is this is really rare from Rush. Missing missing a key like that on a kick target is something that like mostly sends won't miss, and Rush almost never misses those. Yeah, Huni's over aggression comes out. He ends up getting himself killed. Rush actually saves this kill for the for Jensen and ends up changing his um, auto slow to Pope Walter, which I thought was a really smart play here, and um, it guarantees that they get two kills instead of just potentially one. Yeah. So Immortals gets the top turret, and immediately they're, they're just playing super objective focus. They're not going for like any um, really risky plays anymore. I mean, obviously that two v two is a little bit over aggressive, but it started off a solid rotation where they're sending four people top to get the turret, and then they're having their mid lane rotate slash hover to that side, and they're trying to just make a play centered around where the objective is. And as soon as they got the objective, they move their bot lane back down and they focus um, the dragon. Also, they something that I really like that Immortals does is they really prioritize crashing their waves into the enemy turret so that they can never get frozen on. Um, in this situation, if they didn't crash the wave, uh, and let's say they the other option would have been going for Rift Herald, they push in the wave like half ass to maybe um, maybe like where the golems are on the map, and 
they said they're bot lane back and they take Rift Hailed and then they back. Malphite can just free farm that with his teleport and if there's ever a fight on the other side of the map, he can just TP and this forces the enemy team to do something that isn't in their benefit. Um, if if they if let's say that situation did happen, um, they don't push the wave all the way into turret and Malphite sits up there freezing. Immortals has to either force on the bot turret and they, they either need to force a potential dive and then back out once Malphite TPs bot turret or they go mid where Victor has a shitload of wave clear um, and try to take that turret. Neither of them should work out. Uh, in this situation, Jensen got chunked really low, so they had to give up the mid turret anyway, but these are not easy plays to make. It's a lot smarter to do what Immortals did, which is just crash the wave so that you have options. The wave's coming back to you now, so if you pressure mid, the top the top laner has to miss, miss farm. Um, worst comes to worst, you just have your Quinn run around with your team up until the wave pushes to a safe place, and you just end up farming the wave with the Quinn. So um, definitely good uh, wave control from them. And yeah, they take they take the mid turret, they send people back, and immediately they just end up going for the objective. Pretty smart play. Now this is the point for Immortals where they can kind of slow down the game a bit. It's pretty hard at this point to just go for the inner turrets. Um, the easiest thing to do in a competitive game at this point is you start starving out the enemy. You get vision control over one of the sides of the jungle, depending on what you want to control next. At this point, I don't think they're strong enough to tank Baron or do Baron. So in my opinion, they should be setting their vision control up bot side jungle, and you take the enemy jungle, take your own jungle, so you're getting three quadrants of the jungle and getting more farm. And then when the, when the dragon spawns, you keep your vision control, you just take the second dragon. So um, that's pretty much how you play out from this point. Uh, they decide to send their bot lane top, which I personally didn't like because the wave wasn't pushing super hard on them and they lose a free turret for this. Um, they might end up trade trading, but essentially when you're behind, or when you're ahead, you don't want to trade turrets. When you're behind, you want to trade turrets. When you're ahead, you don't want to trade turrets. You kind of just want to control um, what the enemy has uh, and play like a solid game. So here they end up like trading tier 2 for tier 1. Kind of a good trade, but honestly, I think that it's better to just um, play for staying ahead of them rather than everyone having 1,000 more gold, or both teams having 1,000 more gold. But they are still maintaining control of the enemy jungle. If you see, they got all their vision top, um, and they end up uh, getting ahead off that. This fight specifically, I just didn't like it all, though. And I'll, I'll tell you why. Let's actually go back a little bit and watch it. So let's go back to 28 minutes. So this is when they start pushing. They keep going. Okay, they push. All right. Right here, what you want to be doing is you want to wait for your Quinn to get pressure on the Malphite. The reason you pick Quinn is to have split push pressure on a Malphite and be able to roam. Uh, the way you want this to play out is you want four people holding the enemy team mid Quinn pushing the wave all the way to the bottom turret, you get vision control in the bot side jungle, and you force the enemy team to either go the long way to defend turrets, um, which eventually you'll end up getting damage on both turrets and chipping them both down, and this is obviously done when the enemy team has wave clear, because if the enemy team has wave clear, you can't just run a mid and hit the mid turret, uh, Victor will just clear that every time. You wait for Quinn to get put pressure. He'll eventually push in the Malphite. I mean, theoretically, I don't, I don't even know if he can, because he's got a, a mon that the Malphite has a Sunfire, Sunfire Tabby. I don't even know if, he, if he's strong enough to still win that matchup, but theoretically, when you have a split pusher, I mean, he's two levels up. He should probably be able to do it. Quinn pushes in the wave all the way to the bot, to the bot tier two. They keep four people mid, and they don't get engaged on. You cannot get engaged on here. You want your Quinn to push in um, all the way to the tier two. You push up all the way to the tier two in mid, and then you get vision control of the bot side jungle, and you switch between towers... Um, over and over again, and you clear out the enemy vision in their jungle. And the reason you do this is because eventually the enemies are going to be laid on one of the rotations. It's super hard to walk all the way around from the tier two to the tier two, uh, tier two bot to the tier two mid over and over again. Eventually, you're going to just be out rotated. Quinn will push in a wave. Lux will push in a wave. They'll meet two waves at once, and then Immortals is just going to go to the lane where the enemy team isn't. So, um, let me open this up again. But um, yeah, that's what I think you should be doing here.
And what, what C9 does here is a good is a good um, engage. They know that this can happen. They don't want to wait for Quinn to push in, and they just engage immediately. And this forces Quinn's TP out, and it kind of ruins the play for Immortals. Um, like Immortals right now is 5k up, and this just shows how weak of a team fight comp they are. They're 5k up, and they're going pretty much even in a fight. They're actually slightly losing this 5v5 that they just TP'd into. So uh, definitely, like when you play split push, you need to actually split and like play the map like that. And yeah, they end up they end up losing the fight uh, three for two because they, instead of playing the macro game, they just took a fight. There is a point when you play split push comps where you are far enough ahead to do something like this. You can just go for the five v five and just accept that um, even though you have a weaker team fighting comp, you're just far enough ahead in items that you'll just win the fight because you're just stronger champ. You're just stronger champion for champion wise. But if you take these fights and you're you haven't reached that point yet, you just end up losing to a team fight comp. So this is just, it just slows down the tempo of the game. If Immortals wanted to make like a super clean, super fast win, they should just be like running here. Like Rainover should just W flash out, or just flash out like he did, disengage, and you should just be running. You shouldn't be turning in. They're trying to fight this. And, and it's really hard to fight. Like Malphite has an ulti yet. There he brings out the ulti. That's when C9 is strongest, when they're fighting 5v5. Yeah, this is obviously, like, harder stuff to do in game. Like, in, in LCS, it's harder to make calls like this. It's a lot easier to just be like, oh, we're ahead. They're fighting. Fight. Like, generally, you'll see teams be over-aggressive for fights um, in LCS. But this is something that, like, theoretically, looking at the game, if you're trying to analyze the game, the smarter play, push up bot, push up mid, get vision control of the enemy side jungle, rotate between lanes, get chip damage on both turrets. And there's, there's, there's things you can do that are variations of that. Um, let's say you go, um, you, you keep three people mid, you stay in safe position from mortal side, you send the Nilly to gank the, the Quinn, or gank the Quinn lane. The Malphite gets chunked, maybe has to burn ult, then you're free to like, to, to bring more people, you can play more aggressively, maybe then you can take a team fight because Malphite doesn't have ult anymore. You have to kind of abuse the cooldowns that the enemy team has, because that is the reason why they're a team fight comp. When they do have their cooldowns, they're strong. Um, you need to take those situations and try to exploit those 5v5s and not fight a bunch of direct 5v5s, which is what's happening now. Um, and they end up losing them for the most part. But yeah, as you see, this is the reason why the game's getting close, is because they're not using their comp correctly. Like th this, this fight is super risky. I mean, they end up winning it here. Um... They they get they, they end up like outplaying in the situation and winning the fight, but these are not super good fights. These are not fights that you'd expect from a team that's 5k up. Like you can see by the HP values that these fights can go poorly a lot easier than um, a 5k gold lead would dictate. Yep, and Turtle ends up cleaning it up. I guess it was good. It was good play for Immortals, like good coordination on throwing the Brom at the Victor, and everyone just snap focusing the Victor. But um, it it could, it can go better. Like there there are ways to make this less of like a risky game. And it's normally the way Immortals plays. They normally take a lot better fights than this. Um, I think it's probably just the fact that they don't play a lot of like Quinn Nidalee comps in LCS. They normally play comps where um, they have at least a team fighting jungler. Like, normally they'll have a carry top laner and a team fighting jungler, but now they have carry jungler and carry top laner. So it just changes the dynamic of how your team fights are actually going to work out. So, yeah. It's a replay of the fight. So, yeah, from this, you just have to think about, like, what is the next objective for Immortals. Uh, at this point, they still don't have anyone that can truly tank Baron. It's pretty risky to go for a Baron here with their comp. Uh, I th in my opinion, they should have wards on Baron so the enemy team can't rush it. But once they force the enemy team to catch waves, they should still be playing to the boss side of the map, getting the dragon, and then playing for the tier two and um, the tier two turrets in mid and bottom, and also just farming the enemy jungle. So yeah, those are the options I'd like to see here.
But, um, yeah, I mean, this is a pretty kill-heavy game. 30 kills in 22 minutes, dude. This looks like an NA scrim. I'm serious. So, yeah. This is why you can't siege mid um, against wave player. This right here is the exact reason. They just end up clearing the wave over and over again, and then you just eventually have to back off and catch your waves and you just lose pressure. I actually think in the mid game, um, this is kind of where High shines. He's really good at recognizing what the enemy team's doing wrong and what the enemy team's win conditions are and playing against those well. So that's why you saw those snap engages from C9 and those 5v5s. It's really hard to take an engage when you're down 5k. That's, pe that's something that a lot of people wouldn't do, but that's something that High does recognize and he just trusts his game knowledge and his intelligence to just um, make calls like that and he does them well. And once again, this is this is another situation that is beneficial for C9. C9 would rather be grouped as five people fighting against five people here than having to play the split game and chasing around a Quinn all day and potentially, like, you know, losing control of their jungle, losing vision control, and, um, like, giving away free objectives off that. This is just such an unnecessary fight once again. This is when it's, like, starting to become pretty risky. They outplay it. Um, I don't know if Jensen didn't have cleanse there, but he didn't end up cleansing the bind. He got killed by Quinn. Turtle's just going ham as fuck. He ends up living somehow. But these are super close fights. I mean, they started with Adrian just dying, and then they 4v5 the fight. They end up winning like this, but... Um, they're, they're, the easiest ways to win, especially with their comp, are to just play the rotation game and focus the side objectives over and over again. They could have had the dragon at like 20 minutes, maybe maybe 19, I'm not sure exactly when it spawned. But if they just kept on playing the rotation game from turret to turret, C9 would have a lot fewer options of engage. Um, and it would just make the game a lot simpler and they would extend their lead up to the point where they could do Baron and just swap their vision control from bot side to top side, control Baron. Focus um, pushing in mid and top, and then what, if the enemy team doesn't respect their vision control, they do Baron, and if the enemy team does respect their vision control too much, then they just, um, uh, or if the enemy team does respect their Baron too much, then they can take a fight when they have vision control advantage. Uh, obviously, it's easier to take a fight when they have to run into you as a team. In these, in these situations mid, both teams see each other directly. So it's a 5v5 where both teams get to like pick the engage that they want. Whereas if you have vision control, you at least have the advantage of a 5v5 where the enemy team is chasing into you. Um, they might not all come in grouped or they might come in two grouped. You can land a good Brummel, you can land a good laser, and you can get picks that are a lot easier to facilitate than the picks that you get when both people are just 5v5 standing in mid lane looking at each other all day. So, yep, Immortals is doing the smart thing now. Uh, they actually didn't get Dragon because they want to use the most out of their Baron. I'm fine with it at this point. Dragon is no longer their win condition. They just blew the game wide open. They're up five. They're up 10k at this point, so they pretty much doubled their gold lead. And they can just go for inhibitor turrets. Like, the second Dragon's not going to matter. Sure, it gives you like a little bit of turret burn right now, but that's not what's going to win the game at this point. The way you're going to win this game again... At this point, is you just group up, the enemy team can no longer wave clear because magic damage just kind of sucks against Baron minions. And you just group up, take free inhibs. And um, at this point, it's just too hard for C9 to win. They can actually lose the 5v5 team fight at this point. If they engage a 5v5, they'll still lose the fight, which is the point where um, Immortal should have been waiting for, the point where they can actually just start uh, looking for these 5v5s and just abusing the enemy team. But... Um, yeah, I don't know. Huni gets caught again. Huni played, like... He played so disrespectfully this game. It's actually, like, pretty... I would be pretty annoyed with this if I was, like, a teammate. I, I just like when people play the game correctly. And, like, he's, like, going for a 1v4 pick in their jungle at 27 minutes when none of his team around, is around. So, it just things like that are just, like, really unstructured. And it just makes the game a lot uglier. 
Sure, they end up winning the fight, but it, I mean, C9 could have backed off. The only reason C9 took the fight is because it was 4v5. And, uh, yeah, I mean, maybe it was just an extended bait from Huni, but in, in my, um, in my opinion, it was just, like, overaggression and just, like, pretty, pretty bad time to try to get caught or try to force something. Actually, they're talking about the turtle build right now. I actually really like this type of build into things like Malphite Victor, things that are going to try to one-shot you or, like, Lee Sin. The only way they win this fight is if they go on turtle and kill him. Like, he has enough damage already that if they don't instantly kill him with the Lux laser, he will be able to clean up the whole fight. And he did it a couple times already. So he goes a build that makes him pretty much unkillable, which takes away the C9 win condition of getting a good engage. Like, sure, they can try to get a good engage on Huni, but Huni doesn't even matter in the fight. They literally just had Huni suicide and then won the fight 4v5. So, um, with Turtle building like this and being unkillable, there's no way for C9 to actually engage and win team fights. Like, look at where his team is, though. When he's going for this, his team is, like, in base. His support's at the tier 2. You want your support, like, your support's your only tank on this team. Your support should be starting off the team fight here. But yeah, they end up winning it anyway because Turtle just gets his Maw proc, uh, gets his Stair Axe proc, and just ends up running into the whole team, popping both of his big health gain shields and just winning based off that. And now C9 has reached the point where they can just run at the enemy team and end the game. But yeah, um... This game wasn't the cleanest closeout from Immortals that I've ever seen, but uh, generally speaking, I think their early game is still extremely clean. The way that they rotate around the map and take turrets, um, and the way they prioritize turret after turret um, pre-15 minutes is the reason why I think that they're the strongest team right now, and the reason that they're 10-0 in the LCS. So, um, I hope you guys liked my VOD review. This is the first one. Give me some pointers on what you think. If you guys want me to completely mute the casters, I'll do that. If you want me to develop a custom overlay so my camera's just not isolated in the bottom of the screen, I'll do that as well. So, um, thank you for watching, guys. Uh, leave some comments down below, and make sure to like, and if you haven't already, subscribe.